And a tree has to be. Yes, a tree. Okay, I prepared an hour, so short somewhere. Okay. So let me introduce Professor Leon Sanders. And I will read out her short bio so I don't get it wrong. Uh, Eliane is also uh, from Holland, originally uh, based mostly in Dimension. Her background is language and language, speech, and computer sciences, as well as cognitive science. The Dutch people are sort of multi aren't they? <laughs> At uh, Radboud. In, in mm -hmm. mm -hmm. She got a PhD in social sciences from there in multimedia support of early literacy learning. She is now a associate professor at the Behavioral Sciences Institute. That's, that's uh, uh, Ludo's home base. And uh, she is also professor with an endowed chair at, uh, in reading and digital media at Twente. University in a place that's, uh, if I had it written down, I'd be able to pronounce it. Enschede. Hmm? Enschede. Enschede. Only the Israeli can say this. Only the Israeli and the Dutch, we have this in common. And uh, thank you. Sorry to. Uh, I'll squeeze it in at uh, 3 uh, 40 minutes. Done. Yeah. I can do it in 40 minutes. Oh, 60 sure. minutes off, so. Yes. Anyway. So it, the talk said multimedia comprehension, but this is sort of more the better thing, hypertext multimedia and hypermedia comprehension. And uh, what I want to do in this talk is explain that most of the research that we do, I'm not sure if that's also the case for you, is of text comprehension, which is okay because there has been great work on that, but hypertext comprehension is more complicated perhaps because hypertext are texts that are connected through the hyperlinks. And multimedia comprehension would be text combined with pictures and or audio, which is also a bit more complicated, right? And then you have hypermedia comprehension, which is the internet, which makes life even more complicated and hardly doable for us as researchers. And so this is my talk. I first talk about Hypertext comprehension and multimedia comprehension and then hypermedia comprehension to ease you into the difficult stuff. Hypertext comprehension. We all are on the internet every day, but we only have implicit knowledge about what a hypertext is, at least uh, there's variation in structure. You know, you know it, but you don't realize maybe. So there's a linear structure. If you go from page to page, there can be a network structure, so if you click on one link you go to this page and then go back again and everything is networked. Or you can have a hierarchical structure where it's just a beginning page and then it goes down easily. So that's the variation in structure you can have while reading hypertext. There's also variation in the hyperlink type. So for example you can have intratextual links which you have on a typical Wikipedia page, you click and you go a li little lower on the same page. You can also have intertextual links, which means that you click on a link and you go to a different page written by the same author within the same document. Or you have extra textual links, when you click on a word and you go to a new document written by probably another author. So that's complicated because in comprehension research we do a lot of work on inferences that people have to make when reading a text and you can imagine that this inference might be much easier than this one and this one could be completely you click and then, oh, oops, now I'm on a page of, I don't know where I didn't want to be <laughs> did that. so this is then the model we all know and love by Chuck Perfetti the reading systems framework which does not really deal with this. He has done some research on multiple document reading with uh, Jean-François Rouet and Ambret, but multiple documents reading is different from hypertext reading. Um, you would say that inference making becomes more difficult, as I just said, but there's also the cognitive flexibility hypothesis, which actually states that it might become um, 
that, that reading hypertext might help you as a reader because you have to be more active as a reader and to construct your own pathway which makes that you have a better situation model constructed. So there's, well, we don't know yet. We did several studies with children reading hypertext, hierarchical hypertext, so the simple ones. This is a hierarchy. There are 10 pages, that's here, and these are the splits. Uh, they either read a linear text, a linear text with an overview, which should help them facilitate a hypertext with hyperlinks or a hypertext with an overview on top of that. Mm -hmm. There hasn't been too much research on hypertext reading in children, a little bit, of course, with adults. Um, this was a within subjects experiment, so the children read four text types. Sorry, the hypertext is a text this which is has hypertext. With links with in hypertext. there, you can jump to what? So if you click on this hyperlink, mm -hmm. you go to another page. So this is the structure of the hypertext. Within and the same hyperlink. text? Yeah. Okay. So this is just one text. This is hypertext Single comprehension text. Okay. within the same text. If you go to another text, that would be hypermedia. Okay. It's so hyper. It's all new to me. It's so hyper. You can lose, get lost in hyperspace. There was a question. All these young people all know this. No, no, no. Mm -hmm. All okay. people okay. need to be taught these new things. <laughs> You know, hypertext has been around since 1968. <laughs> yes, but you weren't born then, but I was. <laughs> I wasn't uh, even thought about. <laughs> so, so learning from hypertext, we start, the Netherlands have a tracked educational system, so after sixth grade, uh, when they're 12 years old, they'll be going to different tracks, where pre-university is the highest track, about 15% of the children go to pre-university. So this we, we started with uh, uh, 71 children, they read four texts on topics that they didn't know too much about, which would be different probably, especially here in Haifa, Russia, South America, Oceania, and South Africa. Uh, we studied their navigation pattern, uh, whether they learned from the text, and they also were asked to make a mind map of the text, uh, in the, with the intention for us to sort of tap into the situation model. But if that's really a situation model thing, you never know. But I was telling you. This is uh, South Africa. I always think it's Siberia, but it's South Africa. It says here, this is really cold uh, in South Africa. If you go really to work down, but there's also the jungle. And okay, navigation and reading time. Reading time didn't matter. So it took them uh, across the four different text types. It took them about 10 minutes to read the text, no difference. So it didn't take longer to read a hypertext than a linear text. The linearity, by definition, a linear text is read linear. You go from page one to two to three to four. The linear text with an overview was not read linear, which sort of makes this not the two by two design that every reviewer wanted us to have it, because it wasn't. You can click on the overview and then go to another page. So then it's not completely linear. Hypertext and hypertext with overview, and what you see is that there is a decline here. Read less linear, but does that impact your understanding of the text? Huh, hardly. So what you see here is we have multiple choice questions, explicit and implicit. Uh, the explicit questions were easier than the implicit, so red is higher than grey. Easy. Uh, but the only difference between the text was that the linear text with an overview was a little bit better than the hypertext. But that was the only, it was really a small effect. So in general, no. Children were okay, no differences in reading comprehension. The mind maps, in contrast, were more complicated in the hypertext conditions. And with more complicated, I mean that there were more uh, hierarchies in the mind map, and more to, uh, second and third order hyperlinks. Uh, um, how do you call it? Thingies. Thingies. Thingies in the mind map. Uh, Elements. Yes. <coughs> so, more dots, more mm. notes. Ah, Richer. Okay. Richer. Richer. So, more in concepts. the linear text, they made more of a sunshine, you know? More concepts. Oh, more concepts, thank more you. More, more concepts. Whereas in the hypertext, it must be more elaborated, especially here. Uh -huh. So, more fine grained. Mm. A 
especially when there was an overview. So summary, learning doesn't seem to be hindered. They get the questions afterwards by the hypertext and facilitated by the overview. Possibly deeper processing because of the mind maps, mm -hmm. which is in line with the cognitive flexibility hypothesis. So indeed, uh, the hypertext would require more active reading, which makes more uh, better comprehension. Mm -hmm. Study two, we went to the sixth, uh, sixth grade, uh, same design. This time the children got the questions together with the text. Uh, we were also interested in individual differences, so we measured what would impact reading comprehension here with the usual suspects. We found in general the same results <coughs> as in the previous study. No real differences between the conditions also for this age group with more variance because in sixth grade all different tracks are together in one class. We did a two by two analysis uh, and took those other as covariates, so word reading, vocabulary, prior knowledge and working memory. There were no main effects of text type and overview. So whether you read hypertext or linear text, doesn't matter. Also whether there's an overview or not, doesn't matter. Decoding and vocabulary were the main predictors mm -hmm. of reading comprehension, making Chuck Perfetti happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Prior knowledge, a little bit. Working memory, nah, almost. There was an interaction with overview and prior knowledge, which is an interaction that has also been found in adults. Uh, it's a moderator, and what you find is that the overview is helpful if your prior knowledge is low. Mm -hmm. So if you know very little about the topic, then the overview helps you in organizing, planning what you're doing, probably. So, no difference in reading comprehension across the text types. Word reading efficiency and vocabulary most important. For the future, what we want to do um, is go towards the network instead of the hierarchical because it gets a little bit boring and I keep saying, well, doesn't matter, hypertext, linear text, <laughs> it's easy. The first results, the PhD student that's working on it did the study with networked hypertext and there now is a clear decline in comprehension where the children really are lower in comprehension in the network condition mm -hmm. than in the linear condition. Mm -hmm. But we're still working in the, on the process uh, data. Are the questions, when you present questions, are they sometimes embedded within the text or are they always they're on paper? paper? They're on paper, first of all they're on paper, but, mm -hmm. but the timing of the questions, because you could put the questions, you know. Yeah, in the first study with the pre-university children, mm -hmm. they got the questions afterwards, so that was really on learning. Yes. Although KK totally does not agree, says there's also comprehension, mm -hmm. so. But it was afterwards, and in the second study, in sixth grade, they got the questions together with the text. Yeah. We are also studying high text comprehension in special groups and we hope to have a paper out soon on deaf children and children who are uh, specific language impairment showing there that also there the difference doesn't really exist so they're not poorer in that comprehension and showing similar predictors mm -hmm. of reading comprehension. But again, with the hierarchical hypertext, not with the network, we're getting there. Multimedia comprehension, see? 15 minutes per topic. <laughs> <laughs> multimedia comprehension, remember multimedia. You probably all know the work by Richard Mayer, The Cognitive Theory of Multimedia Learning, saying that the pictures help in comprehension. If there is a picture next to the text, you're happy because it makes you understand it better. And the modality effect, also very well-known effect, that if you listen, and watch a picture, which is what you're doing now, mm -hmm. is optimal for comprehension, whereas if you would read and there is a text, both information comes in via the eyes and you can get an overload in your working memory. Mm -hmm. It's only there when there's a necessity of the picture. So if you're David Chair or Liverpool Hoofen, you really don't need the picture of the reading comprehension network to help you understand what I'm saying. Or in this example, <coughs> If you are a heart surgeon, if you see this picture, it distracts. See, you're distracted. <laughs> That's a funny picture, and no, 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 you're not listening to me. This picture, hmm, maybe illustrative. You know at least now where the heart shape comes from, right? Funny, nice. This picture, some children say, ew. 
Uh, others say, okay, this helps in the understanding that the heart is not uh, this shape, but that shape. Mm -hmm. And this picture also very helpful, at least for me, because I always forget how things go in the bloodstream. But if I'm a heart surgeon, no, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Need this. This is the fair picture by Richard Mayer, famous one, saying here that words come in through the eyes. Then they go into working memory, and your prior knowledge is clear. Your integrated model, pictures, also be the eyes. And so then you get an overload here if you have words and pictures. Whereas if you have words and pictures, uh, sorry, if you have audio plus pictures, it's a good thing because then you get both strings. He does that typically with this kind of experiments. It's a PowerPoint on how lightning develops. People don't tend to know that it goes from top to cloud. I don't know that either. Anyway, so what, what happens is here, you go from slide to slide, the computer says, takes the speed, and there's text beneath it, and there's a picture here, and afterwards they ask comprehension questions, and with these type of experiments, typically the multimedia modality effects are shown over and over and over again. It's a very strong effect. So if this is with audio, you can better retell afterwards how lightning develops when it's with written text. We thought that it was a bit weird that it was um, that the participants couldn't control the time, so that they were speeded through the slides. And most we found it a bit. Uh, we wanted to know the long-term effects because in school you want to know what people remember. This is a bit of an older study, but I like to show this one because it shows the very clear the effect that we found. Um, directly after reading or listening, we clearly showed uh, the modality effect. So after reading the text, the children had lower knowledge than after listening to the text. Very nice. Mm -hmm. After one week, that effect was mm -hmm. gone. Okay. No difference anymore. So you might as well read what I'm okay. saying now instead How of listening. How old were the children here? Fifth grade. So this is a decline of listening. So after a week you will have forgotten sort of what I said today. This is the quantity, sorry for the spelling thing, quantity of learning. So exactly asking what is in the text. If you go to quality of learning, which is being able to use what you've just learned in a new situation, you see a nice interaction, don't you? Yes. So Directly after learning, listening is better than reading, again, but one week later, uh, yeah, one week later it's the other way around. So funny, so reading is better than listening. We were a bit puzzled here by the fact that the children who read were better a week later, consolidation effect, so you actually know more. Uh, the explanation is, for me, that those um, quality of learning questions make you think because you have to access your prior knowledge about the topic. Uh, I can only come up with an example because we did this with adults too on fMRI and we asked what would you need to know about a person living a Martian, Mar Mars Martian. Martian? Martian. an alien an living alien. on Mars. Mars. If you were to put that alien into the scanner, what would you need to know about the alien? That's what's not in the topic, in the text, but it makes you think and that probably. So we replicated the modality effect but reversed one week later. Cool. It was self-paced learning and not system-paced. So the modality effects disappear, and especially for the quality of learning, there's a reversed effect. Mm -hmm. We've shown it several times, uh, also in adults here, and in the adults we also tested whether it mattered, because somebody said, yeah, well, uh, the test is always written, whereas you mm -hmm. learn oral, so we had here the students have either an oral or written, mm -hmm. and that was just the main effect. And just for your, if you test students here at university, oral exams tend to be more difficult than written exams. There were no associations and individual differences with multimedia or modality effect, and we're now doing this in children with dyslexia, because you might expect that the effects are different for children with dyslexia because they wouldn't be too happy with having to read the text and have working memory issues, so you can imagine how the 
uh, effects might change. The first result that we see there seems to be that especially the effects are sort of similar but that they are in general just really slow and so that you replicate modality effects just in reading times. So that when reading plus this looking at the pictures they really slow down while listening is very much faster. The questions were uh, by listening as well? Or they Sorry. Were, they yeah, had we had oral questions. Yeah. Yeah. But there was only this study. Mm -hmm. And all other studies were just written questions. But at this point, here this student asked, well, it's not fair. It's, it's, it's a, there's a flaw in the design because yeah. we have students listen and then you have written That's questions. Right, yeah. And she was right, so we tested it. But it didn't matter for the effects. It was just the main effect that the oral questions were answered more poorly by in both conditions. In both conditions. Yeah. So we, that was a really fancy side, but yeah. Yeah, that's really yeah. Okay. Ooh, I'm running out of time. <laughs> Hypermedia comprehension, I also want questions. So that's Hypermedia comprehension, remember difficult. Okay. If you read hypermedia, you need self regulation, self regulated learning. You need to plan what you do, you need to monitor what you do. Self-regulated learning is a research field in itself. It's quite a difficult when you are in that field. It's quite a difficult field, I think. But uh, and individual differences are hardly assessed in children, correct? Yes. Good. That's why we do it on adults. I'm sorry? That's why we research adults. Not yes, children. Oh, but so much more fun with children. Yeah, they do the it must be. So then what is self-regulated learning? Correct me if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, planning, monitoring and regulating. Right? You first need to plan what you do, uh, you have to set your goals, you skim the text, task analysis, monitoring is also in the general reading comprehension literature. That's what we do, monitoring. Com comprehension <laughs> monitoring, but here is also tracking of attention going back, regulation, uh, rereading. Often when you read the text too quickly, and you say, oh, wait a second, I don't get it. Yeah. Yeah. At least that's what mm -hmm. proficient mm -hmm. readers do, and all the adults in your study probably. <laughs> uh, as you would have <laughs> very well known, <laughs> self-regulated learning can be taught and then leads to more effective learning. Mm -hmm. in the, oh, I'm sorry, in front of the screen. You know, those people then, probably. Okay. Yeah, Jennifer. Jennifer, yeah. yeah. You know. So my hypothesis is that um, motivation, prior knowledge and executive functioning would be predictive of self-regulated mm -hmm. learning and somehow for me it's very weird that the connection has not been, I can't find it in the literature, direct. The the direct I'm going to read your work then. <laughs> Or maybe you get depressed after seeing these results. <laughs> and then they just submitted their proposals. Okay. <laughs> so we'll and then you expect that self-regulated learning predicts learning gain, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a cool mediation that you expect. And maybe some direct effects. And don't forget vocabulary otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody's happy in reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. well, so this is the model we tested. To what extent do children use the self-regulation, how are different measures related to each other, individual characteristics, and uh, also we did a time series analysis, small one. 62 children, upper grades of primary school, uh, grades 5 and 6, not sure if 4 is in there, oh god, sorry. We had a hypermedia document, so it was a sheltered environment, a web quest, um, that sort of has a structure that you also have, oh sorry, this is Dutch, so you don't get it when you read this, it you sort of has a structure that you also have when self-regulating your learning, so there's an introduction, an assignment, uh, what you have to do, your uh, online resources, um, and a self-test whether you did the assignment right. Uh, here are internet resources, again on the heart, we like that topic. Uh, so here you have hypertext, pictures, well, everything said, there are movie clips in there. We measured self-regulation um, 
with a questionnaire. We measured their motivation for the topic. We did a think aloud because Jennifer said we had to do a think aloud with these children. And Roger as a baby said that too, so we did. And we measured learning outcome. We did two part knowledge test similar to uh, Roger Acevedo's uh, matching words and sentences. So, for example, it says, uh, this, uh, how are these arteries called in English? And then the arteries in your heart, the one with the blood and the one without. Match the words to a sentence, labeling parts of a picture. They also had to make an assignment on organizing a healthy birthday party, good for the heart. Um, and there was a transport. Executive function, inhibition, working memory, short term memory, and cognitive flexibility. We did, we measured everything. And the log files, so we had their online checking what they did, so where they clicked on. It's not eye tracking, just what they clicked on. Etc. So, we had a learning game, which is a necessity for doing this. Nice learning game, good coherence D. So first, the relation between self-regulated learning with the questionnaire and learning gain was not there. So sort of detrimental for the mediation model <laughs> going on. Um, prior knowledge also didn't relate to self-regulated learning, but it did relate to learning gain. Can I ask a question? Sure. So when you said the self-regulated learning questionnaire, yeah. did you look at online self no, the questionnaire is where the children knew how to do it. So if I read a text, I first do this. In if, general. Oh, it's, general. A, it's a trait. But you look at online? Specific. That's the next part. Okay. okay. But here we use the trait. Uh, we also did this with the online with the same, same results. Yeah. In general. If you take the online as a combined measure, you get the same results. We try both. And this was, uh, yeah, so well, both. Yeah, but uh, prior knowledge, predicted learning gain, executive functionings, nothing there. Wow. <laughs> you would expect her, wouldn't you? Me yeah. too. Uh, the good news is that in the next study, when we do a flanker task, there is an effect. Okay. Yeah. But that's not here yet. <laughs> Motivation. Ah, they were all motivated probably, so they didn't do anything either. And vocabulary, yes, predicted learning gain, and also self-regulated learning. So, complicated, but uh, not as uh, the happy effect that we wanted to find yet. So, but we're getting in a new study, we also do it in diets. So two children working together, and then a flanker task, and then we look at how they impact each other. So how you, your prior knowledge predicts your learning game. The activities over time are a more happy picture. Mm -hmm. The assignment, so what you know the model of Zimmermann on self-regulation yes. and what you see is that the students do that. So the assignment pages are viewed longest in the beginning, the content pages are viewed longest in the middle and the content overview and the review pages towards the end. The think aloud data is interesting, most children couldn't do it. So that's why we never listen to Jennifer anymore. <laughs> think aloud. They, they found it really, <laughs> she knows, it. She, they found it really difficult. But there were 16 children who could do it, and those, for those children, we see time effects, and with the, we could, uh, there were nine children who learned, uh, were successful learners, and seven were less successful learners, and the more successful learners had more metacognitive utterances in the beginning, and more cognitive utterances in the middle exactly as you would expect, whereas this was not the case for the, the, uh, the least successful learners were not self-regulated, mm -hmm. so there were no correlations there. The discussion on this part is, well, the assignment is pretty closed, so it was you have to do this and this and this, mm -hmm. whereas when the assignment is more open, you probably need more self-regulation to do it anyway. Central analysis. Temporal analysis, uh, we sort of were a bit crude in taking the, dividing it in three. So if you study 45 minutes, we took three times 15 minutes, mm -hmm. and if you study 30 minutes, three times 10. Um, 
Prior knowledge and vocabulary stands out as the main predictor of learning, also in hypermedia learning, and the SRL activities differ between the more and less successful learners. Mm -hmm. Overall, well, we're getting towards the end, final slide, big leap from comprehending Ningmea text to hypermedia comprehension, but very much similarities in the prediction of learning or comprehension, prior knowledge and vocabulary. And I'm very happy to be in this group because you're doing what I say that people should be doing <laughs> and what I said in the beginning to you, 1968. So this is uh, what, um, what's his name from Google, the mother of all demos, what he's doing all the time. That's, this was the first. <laughs> and this was a showing of what a hypertext could be like. So we're getting in the right direction. And if there are any questions, I'd like to take now. These are all the people who have been working a lot on this and couldn't do without him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. For questions. Wow. I'm sorry that I had to rush through it though, but anyway. <laughs> for us, this is very interesting. Wow. Thank you very much. You're it's uh, very, very related to two works that are being done here. One in uh, receiving feedback on self regulated learning. And, mm -hmm. the first, uh, and, and specifically, one of those works, and Lila can say some more, is receiving feedback. And what we call another call as well is calibration of comprehension. Uh -huh. How calibrated you are, and uh, and if you do any type of work where the learners receive any type of feedback. Exactly. And, um, and this was just in the wild. See what they do when there's no uh, feedback, yeah, and, and there, you really yeah, want to. You yes. sit there as a researcher and you go. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you can do now. That's yeah. good. That's interesting. And you you will find effects. Oh, yeah. We don't know. But if executive function, I'm not sure. Wow. <laughs> it's like a task. And yes, and we, the next question is, the next, and this is Vera's work, is really looking in um, students with and without attention deficits. Yeah. And this is why the interest in executive function in relationship, you know, both mm -hmm. to self-regulation and to comprehension. If you have any insights you just said, so we wrote this down about the flanker task, about what executive function tasks. Mm -hmm. Would you recommend or winter is, uh, is attentional control mostly, right. so that's good. And so these were uh, normal children, uh, also the ones with attention problems. So we didn't delete anyone. So there were, uh, I'm not sure if there were children with ADHD in it, probably. But, but I don't know, but you will probably. I still uh, hold on to the first model that I showed, but I didn't find it yet. But mm -hmm. it's, it's so obvious that you will find. The relation between executive function and self-regulation, right? But might be the case. <laughs> we <laughs> were thinking also <laughs> the so obvious, yes. But the alternative is also that the children might be a little bit too young yet yeah. to yeah. be able yeah. to do that. Yes. And that if you go to secondary schools right. or to the fourteen year old, that they are able that their executive functions have developed more mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they do. Yes. Yes. And then you will find more also when you use a, a higher level text. You should be using more executive functions yes. than uh, uh, word knowledge or decoding, maybe. But, but this was on the heart, so that was pretty high knowledge. It was complicated. Text it was there. complicated. Yeah, but it could be the case that, that there's not not enough self-regulation going on yet yeah. at this age. Although but we did there see were six grades. There were sorry. There were five and six grades. Yeah, five, 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 ten to yeah. twelve. They were, but. I can imagine that it gets better the planning, etc. when you are a bit older. Yeah. But still you would see it, you should see it here. Okay. But. Another, this is so interesting, <laughs> another point for discussion. There are some studies now running also in the Technion and also in our lab looking at the difference between performance on paper and on computers. And there's some work by Kekatakilman and in Israel by Juan Eshet and also work being done here that finds in university students and also in children that children still spend more time reading from paper and their comprehension and calibration, this calibration is, is higher on, uh, on paper. Of course. And, and, and I wonder how this interacts with this work, you know, uh, with hypermedia. So it doesn't interact because I think so I mean, how, whatever, how yeah. are we going to deal with so, it? So we're, I, we're not going to do that. I think we're not because hypermedia is there and you want children 21st century skills, right. etc. To, to, to be able to do this and we need to find out how to best help them 
when so they're in this modality. But, but reading online is really, uh, especially when the text are long and you have to scroll right. and you, have, you don't have your landmarks that you right. do when reading. And they book. finish quicker. I mean, most of these studies show that they spend less time on the computer. We had a small text. Mm -hmm. That's why we didn't find the difference. Uh -huh. It was only 10 pages mm -hmm. with, uh, I don't remember how many words, but anyway, small. So then we don't find the difference. And they didn't have to scroll. That was it. And, and mm -hmm. the scrolling really it's is, right. if, if you ever read mm -hmm. online, and not a, right. a virtual book where you have to virtually flip the right. pages, but like this, you're lost because you yeah. don't know where you are in the book. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's somewhere that that scroll line, but that's, mm -hmm. and so the landmarks are gone, which is not too well for you. Right. And there's nothing you, yeah, well, virtual paper. Mm -hmm. But so I think we should study what children do online and how to facilitate them. That's exactly what you're doing. So I right hear that's good news. <laughs> Looking forward to it. <laughs> All set. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. In 68, I remember, we got our first television.